I'm reading from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, verses 20 through 25. Jeremiah 3, 20 through 25. Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel. For they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills, and from the multitude of the mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us. We have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Our scripture confronts the oldest and most damaging problem between God and his people. That is true in the Bible and it is true in our own time. And that is the problem of backsliding. Backsliding brought the judgment of God upon the world in Noah's day. Backsliding caused the children of Israel to wander for 40 years in the wilderness and forbid a generation from entering the promised land. Backsliding in Jeremiah's time brought the kingdom to captivity, brought the kingdom down and literally destroyed the great city of God, Jerusalem. Backsliding is more, uh, more stifling, has a more stifling effect upon the ministry of the Christian community, upon the church, upon the family, and upon individuals than any other effect. Nothing has brought more judgment upon God's people than backsliding. The people of God, I suppose, have sinned every and committed every sin known to man outside the sin of unbelief. We certainly must credit believers with that fact. But sinners, Christians, have sinned and committed every sin that is known to man outside of that one, that sin of unbelief. But none, none have wreaked more havoc and heartache than the sin of backsliding. So I'd like for us to take a look at what the Bible has to say this morning about backsliding. First of all, it plainly tells us what backsliding is. Uh, your dictionary falls far short in adequately defining the word. It says backsliding is to slide backward in moral to religious enthusiasm. I agree with that, of course. That is true. But it's far more than that. Certainly, uh, we would agree with that statement. But backsliding we find in the word of God is much more. Verse 20 tells us it is like the, inf the infidelity of a wife. Uh, she plays the harlot. She goes after other men. And of course the analogy applies to the wayward husband just as much so as it does the infidelity of a wife. <laughs> And then the, the discussion 
uh, the verse of Scripture concludes with this statement. So have you dealt treacherously with me. In other words, God is saying just like uh, the wife who is unfaithful to her husband or the husband who is unfaithful to his wife, so you have been with me. Backsliding Christians do not have the same relationship with the Lord that they once had. Verse 21 tells us they have perverted their way and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Put simply, put it as simply as you possibly can and you're not on the, and it is that you're not on the same level with the Lord Jesus Christ that you once were. You have backslid. You have backslid. Now I want you to notice something else from our scripture. And that is that the backslider finds other gods to serve. Verse 21 says a voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel. What does that mean anyhow? Well, God's people had gone away from the Lord. They had built altars upon the various mountains and, and uh, rises in the terrain. They had built altars unto the gods of Baal. And that's where they went to pray. That's where they went to make their sacrifices and to worship. And so in time of crisis, we find them there weeping and praying. But the Bible tells us that it's all in vain. The backslider finds other gods to serve. And so the translation from the gods of Baal to the present day gods is not very difficult at all. Just substitute money, power, popularity, entertainment, pleasure, and you have the whole picture. And the Bible tells us the result is always the same. First Timothy 5, 6, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Jeremiah says the backsliders weep and pray to their false gods. But verse 23 tells us it is all truly in vain. Truly in vain. What's, this, what's, what's Jeremiah, the God's prophet, telling us here? You can serve all of these other gods, material gods, uh, psychological gods, whatever gods you want to take unto yourself, the false gods in place of the one true God. And you can enjoy all of that, but in the time of crisis, they're going to fail you. Your money's going to fail you. The power and popularity and entertainment and pleasure, all of those things, that we spend our time upon and give our time to are going to let you down. Amen. The false gods of the world will fail when you need them the most. Amen. Let me tell you something. If you're backsliding, you are serving some false gods. Why you say, Pastor, I don't have any false gods. Oh, yes, you do. You may not be aware. Oh, no, you may not be able to identify. But if you're not serving the Lord in the manner that he has laid upon your heart to do so. And you're, uh, you, you have fallen into unfaithfulness. Then you're serving false gods. Amen. Now, I want you to notice something else. Backsliding takes us down the wrong road. 
It devours every good thing in your life. Amen. Verse 24 says, It will devour your possessions, and then worst of all, it will leave you with shame and confusion. Amen. Verse 25, We lie down in shame, and confusion covereth us. So many folk try to live without God. Or with just a token of God in their life. And they wonder what happened. What went wrong? What went wrong? There's no mystery here. Just leave God out of your life. And the world and the devil are going to do the rest. I'm thinking of a couple who joined my church years ago. They'd moved to the city and they were starting a new business. And after joining the church, they came to me and said, Pastor, we, we'd like for you to pray for us and for our business that, uh, that we'll be successful, you know. They, they were good folks. Oftentimes it's good folks who make the biggest mistake. They would like for you to pray for us. We'd like for to really make a go of it. I said, I will on one condition. If you'll be faithful to the Lord. As he prospers you that you'll be faithful to him in how in the manner in which he prospers you. That's the only way I'm going to pray for your success. And I want to tell you something. I'll pray for your job. I'll pray for your business. But only on the condition that you're going to be faithful to the Lord. I'm not praying for you to go out there and uh, uh, be successful and turn your back on God. That's what folk are doing every day, especially among God's people today, and in our in our churches, and in our in, as individuals, and in their relationship to the church and in the Christian community. That's what's happened. We wonder why all of these uh, ultra liberal social issues are gaining so much ground in America today. Uh, the sanctity of marriage is being destroyed and all of those things. The Christian community across the board, denominationally, have backslidden. Amen. Have failed to be faithful to the Lord. Oh, there is a token recognition of God in their lives, but there's no commitment. No commitment. Listen, my friend, when you're really committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, you lay your life on the line for God. Amen. Don't try to be uh, play games when it comes to your relationship with the Lord. It's not going to work. Amen. Anyhow, this couple said, well, I'd like for you to pray. I said, I will. I will. And I did. I don't know whether my prayer has anything to do with it or not, but I want to tell you one thing. Their business jumped off the ground. They couldn't believe how rapidly, how rapidly uh, it grew and how prosperous it became. And uh, then... Oh, before the year was up, they decided they didn't need God anymore. They didn't need the church. I mean, their business was what they wanted. It had happened, and they felt like that's where it was all coming from. They backed out of the church. They quit giving anything, quit coming, all of those things. Oh, well, I'll say they quit coming. Haphazardly they came now and then. In 
Within six months, their business folded. I'm not telling you uh, a fairy tale. I'm telling you exactly what happened. But I've seen the similar situations down through my ministry. But one other thing I want you to notice from our scripture. You know, God always provides an alternative. God always provides an alternative. He did in Noah's day. He gave the folks 120 years to repent. Noah preached the gospel of redemption. The Bible tells us that Noah was the preacher of righteousness. In other words, calling people to get right with God and they failed to do so. And judgment came. Jeremiah wept and prayed and, and preached to the people of Judah and of Jerusalem and uh, to the point and they wouldn't hear him to the point that he went to the Lord and said I'm going to quit preaching boy have I ever been there what good is it doing it's just like water off of a duck's back to folk who's supposed to be committed to the will of God and purposes of God and they act like they don't even hear Jeremiah said, I'm going to quit preaching. That's what he did. He said that. But somehow God reignited the fire in his heart. And his heart burned like a, a fire shut up in his, the Bible said, like a fire shut up in his bones. And he brought him the word of God. And so God always offers the alternative. You say, what is that preacher? Well, in verse 22, the Bible says, Return, you backsliding, backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. God has always provided the opportunity for recommitment. For rededication. For reestablishing your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Jeremiah told his people, all the high places cannot save. All those altars that you've built to uh, uh, the gods of Baal are going to be truly in vain. They're going to let you down. They're going to let you down. And then he said, truly, truly in the Lord our God is salvation. There's only one place for the backslider to find hope and redemption. And that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one place to find salvation for those who are unsaved. And that is in Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. Amen. Where are you today? Have you ever trusted Christ as Savior? You need to do so. There's only one way to be saved. And that's in Jesus Christ. We invite you to trust Him today. To share that decision with us. Come and take me by the hand. Give your heart to Jesus. Maybe you say, Pastor, I've been slipping away. But I need to be restored. I want to come back to the Lord. I want to be fully committed to the will of God. We invite you to do the same thing. We're going to sing an invitation here.